While we wait for others to trickle in, we usually give everybody a couple of minutes. Um, would be great for any of you to put in the chat window some encounters you've had where art and science and technology met each other. We also have a poll. Is the poll on, Kartika? Yes, yes. So there's a poll for some questions, just to get a sense of the room. So what was the question that we have to write in the chat that instances where we have met across art and science collaboration, right? Yeah, just something interesting to share with the rest of the room. A festival you may have gone to, an exhibition, an experience you may have had. And with that, I think let's start. So Kartik, I, can, I can't see the poll. So if you can tell us what the room feels like. Well, it looks like most folks are very interested um, in the collaboration and believe that it could lead to new and exciting creations. Um, folks are excited to collaborate across disciplines. They're open-minded, curious to see where it may go. There are a few people who are skeptical and think that such crossovers might be superficial. Nice, thank you. And so with that, welcome to our first dialogue for the year. Uh, we are really, really excited to restart after a little bit of a holiday hiatus. This is the Future Fantastic Dialogue. Uh, Future Fantastic is an upcoming festival that brings together, that is being brought together by all these amazing partners and supporters. Uh, big thanks to the British Council under the India UK Season of Culture grant, uh, Pro Helvetia Swiss Arts Council and the Goethe Institute Max Müller Bhavan in Bangalore. Uh, this entire program that we've been running since June of 2022 has been pulled together by us at Be Fantastic and I am Kamia Ramachandran, the director of Be Fantastic. And Irini here, uh, the creative director of Future Everything in Manchester, UK. Irini, I'll hand it off to you to tell us a little bit about the festival. Great, thank you, Kamia. So uh, yes, the Future Fantastic, which is coming up in uh, Bengaluru in uh, late March 2023 is uh, an ambitious festival that is bringing together the work of uh, almost a year now, uh, including a fellowship program, a series of uh, commissions and collaborations between UK, Indian, but also um, into other uh, like German, uh, Swiss and other international artists, American artists, etc. So the festival is uh, is, is focusing on conversations, is focusing on artificial intelligence, but also art and artificial intelligence, but also conversations in particular around the environmental crisis and climate change and uh, exploring how um, art and technology and in particular artificial intelligence might shape our thinking, our ideas about these um, uh, issues and challenges that we're facing and uh, bring together maybe audiences or questions in different ways. Over to you, Kamia. Thank you. So just quickly about both Be, Be Fantastic and uh, Future Everything, we're both organizations that are quite parallel in terms of what we're after in slightly different geographies. Um, we're all working at the intersection of art, technology, society, uh, and the future. And we create programs and this in this version, a festival together. 
to really bring the energy of folks debating, discussing, and finding a way to walk ahead in our future together. Uh, Max, could so, I see something between arts and science? Because uh, I think uh, I recently went uh, to some um, my dad's college meet. So there are many civil engineers were there and they had got into real, real estate pricing, which also comes in economics. So they say that economics is something like, uh, you know, it's an art also and it's a science also, but they were actually civil engineers. So when they were pricing, that time they had to see the inflation and everything. So if they uh, are used to very science, sci they have a scientific bent of mind, then they uh, find it difficult to get into the pricing thing. Just because that if only arts or economics person was there, he could have priced anything, but they think logically. So they get a bit uh, hesitated to price because uh, once their um, creativity doesn't, uh, it just says that, you know, if it's just like an inch of thing is missing or logic is missing, so they don't want to price it because uh, then they uh, give give back from pricing. So they shifted their job from real estate pricing to some other things then. Thanks for that comment, Twarita. Um, we will come back to taking a lot more of your questions and comment, comments really soon. All right, so with that, we would now like to introduce our speakers for the session. Today, we are joined by Monica Bello, Dr. Mukund Tate, and Mike Phillips. Monica Bello is a Spanish curator and art historian. In her curatorial work, she discusses the way artists instigate new conversations around emergent culture and societal phenomena, such as the role of science and technology in the perception of reality. Since 2015, she's the curator and head of arts at CERN, and the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. At CERN, she curates the research-led artistic residencies and the new art commissions that reflect on the conversations and exchanges between artists and particle physicists and engineers, as well as staff of the laboratory. Dr. Mukun Tatai is a physicist turned biologist. He obtained a BA in physics from Cornell University in 99 and a PhD in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2004. Since then, he's been on the faculty at the National Center for Biological Sciences, India's premier life sciences research institution. Tata is deeply involved in public engagement efforts and art science collaborations, working with conceptual artists and theater practitioners to explore the practice of biology and its impact on society. Mike Phillips is professor of interdisciplinary arts at University of Plymouth the Director of Research at IDAT Org, and a Principal Supervisor for the Planetary Collegium. His R&D orbits a portfolio of projects that explore the ubiquity of data harvested from an instrumentalized world and its potential as a material for revealing things that lie outside our normal frames of reference. Things so far away, so close, so massive, so small, and so ad infinitum. Phillips is an active member of the international transdisciplinary commute community that engages with immersive, interactive, and performative technologies, and also manages the full dome immersive vision theater. Monica, Mukund, and Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. I will now hand over the floor to Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Cool, okay. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, share some of the stuff we're doing uh, around interdisciplinary things and, and also around climate change. Um, and I'm going to focus, I'm going to share my screen now and focus on uh, something which I think is a, can you see that everyone? Yes, all good. Yeah, okay. Let me do that. There we go. So, um, Yes, I'm going to focus on full domes, um, mainly because they, I mean, they're pretty cool things, but they also represent uh, an interesting convergence of art and science, um, a space which has been dominated for, for centuries, really, by both the, um, you know, the scientific community and of late has been sort of liberated a little bit by uh, a kind of increasing uh, and global community of artists, um, 
designers, VJs, coders, um, performers uh, who have sort of occupied this space and are really transforming it in a way that is, I think, incredibly mutually beneficial. So um, the dome space is historic. I had a question the previous term. Uh, the previous term, what did that mean? I didn't know the previous slide. Sorry, this, this slide? No, the previous one, chronos in plastic in fundibla. What does it mean? I'm just going to, this is on this slide here. I'm just going to explain that. Okay. Uh, I mean, Varita, let's are, just let the guests speak fully and we'll have time for questions. Yeah, I thought I missed Thank it. Thank you. That. No problem. No problem. Um, yeah, so there are a number of ways, I think, of thinking and conceptualizing the dome. It It, it is, uh, and I'll explain in detail what the full dome is, um, but it there are sort of several cultural references to the way that the dome works, I think. And this is uh, Borges there, talks about, uh, this this place, um, which everything can be seen clearly from every angle without confusion and and or, or blending. And this is uh, from Kurt Vonnegut, who talks about the chronosynclastic infindibula, which is a place where all truths come together. And I think this is something that the dome can represent in terms of an interdisciplinary relationship. It. Um, I mean, the, the IVT, the Immersive Vision Theatre, which is a space I look at, uh, look after in, in Plymouth, is a is a nine meter full dome environment. It, it's quite small, but as you can see there, it's it's got like 40 seats. Um, we've just replaced the projection system in there, but it originally had a Zeiss star ball, which is the old traditional um, mechanism of getting stars up onto the dome. And it, it re replicates the night sky, as you could see in this um, in this slide here, which is the um print, which looks at this space beyond Earth, it looks at the, the canopy of the stars and, and what lies beyond. And the dome, I think, is this wonderful space where, you know, sort of immaterial, material and imaginary worlds sort of come together, mainly because we're, we're speculating a lot of the time about what is out there. Um, and domes, there's many different kinds of domes um, and they all have different kinds of technologies inside them from old size star balls, which are just a light bulb with lots of lenses and, uh, and, and pinhole cameras in reverse uh, to really quite sophisticated projection systems, which uh, use fisheye lenses or complicated blending technologies uh, to even now there's uh, plans for LED screens that are completely immersive 360 surround uh, immersive spaces, which allow a large number of people to uh, to see that environment. There's also this incredibly strong and powerful community of international festivals, which which uh, we take part in through our Full Dome UK uh, collaboration, which sees those spaces which have traditionally been used for communicating science being used for uh, more experimental, um, participatory. Uh, and, and speculative, creative activities. And of course, this difference is, is quite weird because all the stuff that was made for uh, communicating science was made by, uh, made by artists, made by media practitioners, but uh, through the uh, direction of scientists. And now there's this shift going around, which I think is uh, making the dome space and the technologies that underpin the dome, which are so similar and sort of um, transparent in the in the movement of, of media content to a virtual spaces, to augmented spaces. So all of these technologies are very slowly converging um, and can give you a very personal, intimate engagement with content, but also um, large scale uh, group uh, communication and experiences. This has a history within the arts as well. This is um, EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology from 1970, where uh, uh, people like Raschenberg uh, and Billy Kluver were working uh, in a collaboration, uh, Billy Kluver from um, uh, at and Bell Labs and Raschenberg being uh, one of the major American artists of the time, still is. And um, here they were bringing together an experience in a mylar dome, which just sort of represents the sort of experimental sort of fervor that can exist around a space like a full dome environment. 
and the community of people working with full domes as well. And these are several of our um, graduates. There's Roy Ascot at the side there who ran the plan for Collegium uh, for, for uh, you know since the 90s. Um, we have really cool people like Donna Cox there who works um, uh, doing high powered um, data visualization. She's an artist and brings her insights and knowledge to create these really powerful uh, immersive environments. To Shah Davis, whose work back in the 90s was uh, really visionary in the development of virtual reality headsets, which are now commonplace. Um, Isabella Bayer there, who works uh, uh, envisioning uh, some really interesting data from all sorts of different spaces into full dome and game environments. And David McGonville on the right, on the right there, who's uh, worked with the Buckminster Fuller Institute um, and uh, climate change initiatives around uh, big data, extraordinary kind of people working towards uh, creating an interdisciplinary environment and the dome being a space where this happens very uh, easily. And just as an example, I've got several slides here which, which explore how um, different kind of scientific uh, disciplines bring their skills uh, through collaborations with artists to make uh, really quite uh, experiential and immersive um, content. This is actually, this is a Blender, which is an open source uh, 3D modeling software. That animation there is actually a height map taken from an atomic force microscope. And that height map was just captured and placed into uh, a, a game engine and then played back in a dome. And what we had working with uh, atomic force microscopists who actually spent most of the time looking at a tiny screen at the smallest things imaginable, suddenly they were immersed in the smallest thing imaginable in the largest space imaginable, which is kind of the infinity of the dome itself. To working with uh, biologists, looking at capturing and modeling uh, data around, uh, in, in this case, insects, and an interesting kind of philosophical divergence that's happening in a world which has been entirely ocular in terms of you know uh, both uh, our our, um, our culture being focused on photography and image making to suddenly being able to understand the world through these uh, data sets. And there's a real problem we have uh, in Plymouth with uh, understanding uh, creatures. A lot of our biological uh, students actually recognized insects more through their DNA data than they can through their morphology. So they, they can recognize an, a creature through its DNA, through its data, but they actually they don't recognize it when they see the thing, which is a really interesting flip that's happening, I think, in the way we understand the world. Two, um, uh, th this is my head here. Sorry, I've got the sound on. Um, uh, this is my head. This is from an MRI scan. Uh, which uh, allowed us to create a, a dynamic environment, which we use for several performances. So th this was a, a, a creative output, but from a, a workflow of exploring data visualization, uh, image capture from MRI scans using um, um, magnetic resonance, uh, to then look at how you could make this into a volumetric space. Two amazing technologies. This is a LiDAR scan placed in uh, Unreal, a game engine. Uh, this is actually not dome corrected, but the same kind of technologies allows us to take data. This is not ocular. This is captured uh, through LiDAR uh, and uh, then placed in these immersive kind of spaces, which are coming from uh, the uh, entertainment industry, this game engine technology, uh, to allow scientists to explore um, you know, the world around them in really interesting details. But also the use of uh, an engagement with uh, audiences. And I think this is really quite interesting in terms of the way, uh, a way forward with these kind of collaborative spaces where audiences actually interact with this data and start to understand it in a very tangible way. Uh, this is a, a piece we made uh, as part of the European Mobile Dome Labs, a collaboration with artists, VJs, um, coders, performers, and scientists to pull together all these different kind of production skill sets and these workflows into these creative and interactive environments. And this is not 
a dome, but this just shows you the kind of versatility of a dome space because uh, this is a construction we built for the opening of the Tate Modern's um, Blavatnik building in London. Uh, and what you're actually looking at here is, is a large LED screen. It's an interactive screen. You could, you could uh, interact with it. We had various robots wandering around as well. But the key thing is, this is actually a game engine in there, uh, taking real-time data feeds, and it, it's literally a dome popped inside out and wrapped around uh, an object. And the data that you can see here is, is human data, is conversations happening through, through Twitter, uh, which have been visualized in these dynamic anim animations um, using a game engine wrapped around the space, uh, and then also pass through um, uh, a sentiment analyzer, which can then look at the data that's coming in, human data, conversations, and analyze uh, how people are feeling at, at this time in real time. So you're starting to move to a very dynamic, real time, and even predictive uh, way of working with uh, these different media sets. And then finally on, on this, um, the idea of uh, you know, how these things can be used for climate change. This is quite a long time ago now, but we were working with uh, earth scientists in the North Devon biosphere here, which is a UNESCO uh, area of scientific interest. Um, working with sensors, these, these are very low, uh, very cheap sensors, sort of Arduino type sensors, Zigbee sensors here, which we were able to distribute across a, a wide space and um, turn the data, real-time data, very granular data, into uh, very uh, kind of emotive experiences with the people who are living in the environment, real-time data feeds coming into the dome. So really the dome, I'm offering it here as uh, an instrument, but also a space for a shared virtual reality. Uh, and as you can see here, this comment from uh, Dr. Fish uh, from the Center of Rural Policy uh, Research at the University of uh, Exeter, as much as the rational technocracies of policy and decision-making might otherwise imply, environment processes need to be felt as much as they understood. And I think this is something that artists um, from all sorts of different uh, disciplines, with sub-disciplines within the arts, offer to scientists uh, to, to enable deep collaborations. Uh, so yeah, a shared virtual reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike. That was really great. Um, we now call our next speaker, um, Monica. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, all good. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen and... Um... Okay, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here and uh, to the team of uh, Be Fantastic and uh, Future Everything. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a bit ill today, so um, yeah, my voice might break, but uh, yeah, just, just be patient with me. So I'm, uh, I'm the head of arts at CERN since 2015. I'm curating and leading the programs in the laboratory. CERN is the, lar uh, the, the, the home of the Large Hadron Collider and is placed in, the, in Central Europe, in Geneva. Um, is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, and, um, and this one of the biggest, uh, the largest uh, <laughs> scientific communities dedicated to physics and fundamental research in the world. So since 2012, we are receiving artists in residency, the first artist in residency uh, as part of the program was Julius von Bismarck, and since then, we uh, have developed different uh, schemes to bring artists to the lab, to spend time and to have the experience and the assess the dialogues with fundamental research in collaboration with the scientists. So um, we've been over these 10 years fostering this dialogue. Uh, is a dialogue that requires, um, yeah, 
I, I would say skills, time, and uh, yeah, spending, um, yeah, having many coffees with uh, the scientists and to understand what they are looking for. And um, so um, fundamental research is the pillar of this collaboration. It's not applied science, although there are many technology, as you can see in the screen. And, um, and, and there is a really interesting interdisciplinary uh, community that uh, deals with many, many topics dedicated to understand what everything is made of. So um, the goal of Arts at CERN is to inspire these exchanges to that they can become significant, and they can generate experiences, um, but also is a way to um, give access and to invite artists to participate in this international cultural and scientific community that um, is at CERN and, um, and, and to bri bridge this yeah, CERN with society and culture at large. So uh, first of all, when we talk about CERN, if you've never been there, it's often a very uh, abstract idea. Um, many of us would imagine uh, the underground experiments, which are the iconic and experiments and the I mean the, the main focus of the technological development at the lab. But uh, CERN is also a large field full of experiments, buildings, and uh, the most important part of it is the community. We are um, around 10,000 scientists, um, uh, engineers, and staff like me. Um, uh, in the, the laboratory uh, is located between the uh, Lake of Geneva and the Jura Mountains that you can see in the picture on the left. And the laboratory, uh, even when it started with only yeah, a couple of hundred people working there in the 1954, is today one of the most yeah, vibrant and dynamic and, uh, yeah, and um, populated uh, scientific environments in the world. So there are uh, man, many of these people, or my colleagues, dedicate their life and their time to understand the fundamental constituents of matter. And for that, they create accelerators and colliders that smash particles that uh, eventually bring events in which they can see how the universe uh, started. And um, the picture on the right, as you see, is the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, inside a tunnel of 27 kilometers. As, uh, as, uh, it's a circle and is uh, around 100 meters underground. So um, before 2012, uh, we had the experience of, and we knew that there were many artists uh, approaching scientists to go to the lab. This is not new. Uh, for us, and we didn't invent anything new. We just created a um, structure that uh, made possible that the artists uh, were part and are part today on the lab dynamics. But in uh, in 1973 uh, and 1970, well, 72 and 73, as you see here in the front page of the Saint Courier, we have this artist, James Le Byers. Uh, coming to the lab, a laboratory that was very different at the time, uh, to explore and to try to understand. He was uh, an artist engaging with performance and fluxus and uh, yeah, actions, and he was wondering about the, yeah, the place of his body, himself, his own agency in the world in compar comparison with these scientific endeavors that were at that moment in the 70s, um, becoming really dynamic. And there was this uh, really interesting moment of yeah, invention and development in physics. So he was there in this, at that moment, he is the only artist so far to appear in the front page of the Saint Courier, which is one of the most important 
um, journals of uh, uh, particle physics. And later in 2005, Gianni Motti is another uh, good example of artists who came to the lab to explore the territory, to explore the spaces that were being created for science. And he did it by um, walking through the tunnel. At the time, the tunnel was empty. The Large Hadron Collider was not yet there. And uh, he walked uh, all along the tunnel to um, uh, find what he said, the antimody. So he was playing with the idea of antimatter, the speed of light, the speed of, well, uh, the, of his spaces, and how he could engage with this big questions about nature uh, by uh, walking uh, in one of the, what was becoming one of the most important physics research centers and, uh, in, in Europe. Later on in 2015, uh, well, actually this was 2019 in, on, the, on the left, you, you see Alan Bogana, Nicole Lulier, and Madeleine Guerre. They were part of our program and they were researching exactly the same places, but with a much more much complex technology and many more uh, theoretical models that this technology had to test. Mm -hmm. And um, some evidence could yeah, uh, come out of this testing. And on the on the um, on the right side, you see Andy Gray, uh, uh, Ripati, um, a sound artist uh, in the Atlas detector in the data room, um, taking, well, uh, doing some field recording. So these are examples of artists who were with us. And uh, since 2015, when I arrived to CERN, we have more than 200 artists uh, spending time with us. So um, I'm not going to go deep in the structure of our programs, but I, I can tell you what we do. So we do artistic residencies, but um, and art commissions and exhibitions and events. Uh, art Satsang uh, has an artistic residency program, but it's not only that, it's the arts program of the laboratory. And we try to explore different ways to engage with art, uh, with art and science. So uh, our pillar are, have been and still are the artistic residencies, but, but since 2018, we support artists uh, to create new works in, after the, or during the residencies. And uh, in 2018, we had, we began a big collaboration in Europe with other institutions, the CCCB, FACT in Liverpool, well, CCCB in Barcelona, Lelier, Unique, Nantes, uh, EMAL in Brussels and uh, some other institutions to have a touring exhibition, which was called Quantum Broken Symmetries. We do events such as this one as participating in these conversations, but also we organize symposiums every year. And from this year, from June this year, we will have a permanent art exhibition in the Sound Science Gateway, and I'll tell you more. So um, our residency programs, which are the, the, the prequel to, <laughs> to the art commissions are Collide. We do dual residencies in partnerships with um, European cities. We began with Arts Electronica, followed by FACT, Barcelona last year and uh, an upcoming collaboration with uh, CC, the Copenhagen Contemporary, which we are about to announce um, from this year in the, and the next following years. So we organize these residencies, they are dual. So we uh, bring artists to CERN and then the artists go to these uh, cities in connection with scientific institutions there. Um, since, uh, well, for the last year, we are, on, uh, we are organizing CONNECT. The, these are dual residencies at CERN and other scientific institutions. And um, we, in, from the 2019 to 2020, we did a, tria, a trial uh, with ALMA-ESO in Chile. 
in last year with Sarao, Sarao in South Africa, these are part of the SKA collaboration dedicated to radio and optical astronomy in South Africa. And uh, this year we, we are about to announce the winner of the uh, Connect India uh, in collaboration mm -hmm. with ICTS in Bangalore. And then uh, next year we are going back to Chile. So the artists spend a few weeks with us and a few weeks in these scientific institutions. And um, we are very glad that this is happening because there were um, a part of our program um, is field work, exploration. This is, uh, these are important focus for the artists. And yeah, and the process is based on that, on this field work and exploring and researching the scenarios, the spaces, as well as the science and scientific models, theories, etc. So uh, for us, it was only natural to connect with other scientific institutions and maybe eventually to do an international network of fundamental science and art. This is a collaboration with Prol uh, and um, and uh, we are working together closely with all the strategy, the structure of the program, and the partners in the different areas. Uh, so fit feedback from our CERN community, I think I always have this question. And uh, so I, I can answer already the question. <laughs> What do scientists get out of these collaborations? We, uh, as I said, um, everything we do is for fundamental research. It's not about uh, yeah, uh, creating applications or uh, experimenting with technologies. Although, well, as you know, CERN is one of the big uh, technological environments in, in Europe. But um, what we have and what we support and foster is this understanding, this connection between what is making science about and what, what art is about. And um, we have colleagues re uh, replying to this question by saying that working with artists reminds them of the purpose of what they do as Chiara Mariotti says, and invigorates your determination towards fundamental research. Uh, Alessandra Necki, a theoretical physicist who was at CERN and now is in the Max Planck Institute in Munich. She said that an artist can shock us with perspectives that challenge our logical view, uh, but they offer our mind a chance to escape from the rules of physics and find creative ways to approach our research. And Regis Alemani, an experimental physicist working at the Large Hadron Collider, said, working with artists allows me to convey my passion for science in the artistic realm. So, um, and then um, art song allows that things like this happen. So, uh, well, we, we, no, we didn't inspire. <laughs> Renzo Piano to build this amazing building that is going to open this uh, summer. But we have an art exhibition in a science center dedicated to science with new, uh, four new art commissions of artists working with arts at sound. So this is opening in summer, in June, July. And um, we will have uh, artworks by Rio Jiqueda, Jun Chu Kim, Julius Van Bismarck, and Claude de la Hoo. So this will be a permanent exhibition space for art and science in the Sun Science Gateway. And uh, that's it. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and questions later. Thank you so much, Monica. We now invite our last speaker for the uh, session, Dr. Mukun Tate. Thanks, Karthik. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. It's already been a learning experience. Um, and, you know, we did get some questions ahead of time from um, people who registered. So I, I thought I would try and address that before we started. So uh, as Monica also said, there's a question of what scientists get out of engagements with artists. So um, here's, here's something which I, I think is a, a problem in science. So when scientists talk to non-scientists, um, I'm not making a generalization, but, but me in particular, 
uh, I uh, uh, certainly have committed all these uh, sins. We tend to dumb it down when we ought to open it up. So instead of saying it's hard to explain, we should say thanks for asking and try and engage with the person who asked the question. Um, many times we ignore the question because genuinely we do feel we're very busy and that this is not our job. Uh, instead of taking the chance to explain the process of doing science, the reasons we do it, uh, and the fun uh, that we have doing it. Um, and, you know, surprisingly often uh, when you engage and there's some pushback asking how you know what you know, um, you resort to um, eventually this uh, excuse of trust the experts. Um, rather than engaging in the much harder problem of uh, convincing people why it matters. And uh, over the last two years, uh, the, the sort of public relations disaster that was scientists communicating during the COVID pandemic really, really brings this home. What would have been a great opportunity to explain science instead became a minefield of uh, disinformation, really because of, um, uh, of course, you know, large number of scientists did participate in trying to um, communicate, but uh, nevertheless, more can always be done. Um, so I believe collisions between art and science force scientists outside their comfort zones and therefore enable essential conversations that otherwise simply would not happen. Um, so at NCBS, um, we've been um, doing this uh, ever since it was instituted. NCBS, where I work, is a fundamental research institution. We do research in biology, cell biology, development, neuroscience, uh, all that good stuff. Um, but um, we also have a, a, a sort of thriving um, um, uh, activity activities in um, art, science, and other collaborations. And I'm just going to walk you through a few of those that I've participated in um, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Now, one piece um, is engagement. Engagement for me means reaching an audience that you would not otherwise reach as a scientist and conveying to them what scientists do and what it means for their lives. Uh, this is very much um, uh, in the, uh, with the scientist point of view in mind. Uh, a few of the things we've done, um, uh, many of them uh, involve uh, programs with the Wellcome Trust, which actually uh, is a very generous funder of these kinds of activities. And the example I'm showing over here is theater science, where over many years, we've actually collaborated with uh, playwrights, um, uh, theater practitioners, um, artists who come for residencies on campus, which are several weeks long, uh, interact with the scientists on campus and develop plays, which are then performed in public to explain uh, scientific facts and make them um, of interest. The goal here is just to get people to think about things they haven't thought about before. So for example, I was a scientific advisor on a play uh, written by Gautam Raja in 2008 called The Invisible River, which was about how the river Ganga uh, is actually chock full of viruses called bacteriophage, which have uh, antibacterial uh, potent effects. Um, and, and the question asked in this play was, you know, maybe the reason people feel that the waters of the Ganga are purifying is simply because they're so filthy that they have all these viruses in it. Um, so it, of course, you know, it, it's a question that makes people think and opens up the complexity of the idea. Um, we also have uh, in the other direct, not engagement, but introspection, looking inwards, forcing scientists to think about why they do what they do and what it means. This is where I think the art science in collaboration comes in. It's not about engagement and simplifying science and pitching to the public. It's really about inviting outsiders into our spaces, giving them free reign to ask whatever questions they want um, no matter how simple or complex it seems, uh, to make us think differently. In this context, um, for many years, I've had uh, a really wonderful collaboration with uh, Yashish Chetty, who you see uh, up on the top left. Um, we first started interacting about 15 years ago. And Yashish, was a, he's a conceptual artist who works at a, an art institution uh, that's uh, uh, not far from NCBS in Bangalore. Um, and we started this engagement actually with a bio art workshop with um, the Australian based uh, artist Oran Katz, where we actually taught artists how to use the tools of molecular biology to manipulate biological systems. Um, since that time, for several years, we've had uh, continuing engagement with the ushers and his students uh, and his team at uh, Srishti, where we've actually every year um, for several years in a row, it hasn't happened for the past few years because of pandemic and other reasons, but we brought in artists and art students, taught them how to use the tools of biology to actually create works of art and works of conceptual art um, to explore the impact of science uh, outside. Um, I should just mention sometimes this thing actually comes full circle. Um, so for example, um, uh, through uh, Art Science Bangalore, I met uh, Joe Davis, who's a conceptual artist who works at MIT and the Harvard Medical School. And Joe was interested in how to encode uh, biological information in living systems. 
And so we actually came up with a code of using the idea of origami to encode three dimensional structures using a binary code, which we then put into DNA, we put into a living cell um, and in a sort of self-referential uh, joke, the um, structure we encoded was the double, double helical structure of, uh, uh, of DNA. So this was actually a, a case where a scientist via an art science engagement comes all the way back to publishing a real scientific paper, uh, which you know in the future could lead to a scientific advance. I'm not saying it will, but it is part of the scientific literature uh, now. So I just want to go back to this uh, art science engagement and spend uh, a little while telling you about what we did and, and my experiences in it. So, um, you know, I'm trained as a scientist. I have no um, uh, training as an artist whatsoever. I just have uh, uh, the experience of working with, uh, with artists. And I can tell you it's a very difficult uh, uh, procedure. It's a very difficult process because you have to meet somebody you trust uh, because you open yourself up. Um, and uh, you have to meet somebody who, uh, who's able to understand what you're saying. And conversely, you're able to understand what he or she is talking about. Um, from their uh, artistic point of view. They have their own um, questions, uh, their own um, interrogation of what you're going to do. Many, a lot of it sounds very critical. Um, but what came out of this was actually, actually astonishing to me. Several real works of art, which actually have been exhibited in museums uh, around the world, um, which, were, which were things that used very simple biological procedures. Anybody in a modern biology lab could do it, but which nobody had ever done before. Uh, uh, the creation of these was prompted exclusively by the artist coming into the scientific lab. So one example was we created a bacterium uh, which encoded uh, a, an enzyme uh, whose product uh, uh, generated the sensation of the smell of rain when humans uh, smelt it. So this is, this is a living creature that uh, evokes the smell of rain. Um, these and, and other aspects, these uh, uh, my colleague uh, Yashas called uh, teenage gene poems in the sense that these are very early examples of how uh, one can generate artistic speculative works using biological systems in genes. Um, another year we actually generated worms um, which uh, had genes knocked out and therefore their patterns of movement were modified and uh, the artistic uh, piece became the exploration of those patterns um, yielding many questions of both biological and artistic significance. Um, and, uh, and finally we have uh, an ongoing uh, uh, project, which is this Hacteria Lab, where we, um, where Yashas, um, uh, with collaborators at NCBS, creates kits for um, sort of do-it-yourself uh, uh, bio art, uh, which in principle um, is a sort of disruption that says anybody can do this uh, outside of the context of traditional institutions uh, in in your own homes and uh, and garages. So all this, um, so I talked about the, the engagement uh, function of theater science, reaching people, broader audiences, simplifying concepts, the introspective view, uh, which is where artists come and, and really put scientists in an uncomfortable position to explain what they do. Um, and, and of course, then the third piece is the two-way discussion. And um, I think uh, both Mike and Monica brought out that aspect extremely well, where we need spaces, public spaces, where anybody can walk in, scientists or not, um, engage with scientists, engage with, uh, with artists um, on very uh, pertinent uh, discussions about how science can um, impact the world. And the subject of today's dialogue is climate change. This is one place where, of course, um, science is having an impact on the world, but it goes much further than that. I mean, it's not just applications, but it's a question of does knowing where we came from as humans change how we view the world and how we view equity, for example. Um, uh, food, climate, health, those are all things that are fairly obvious uh, uh, worries on people's minds that they want to hear about from scientists. So um, I'm actually very proud to say that NCBS is a partner of one of Bangalore's first new science museums in 30 years, Science Gallery, which is part of a global network of galleries of this type, which will have tinkering spaces, um, exhibition spaces, uh, spaces where we can have calls, um, for uh, artists to come and explore themes that are inspired by science, but not limited to it. Um, and this is already online exhibitions, but uh, the building itself will be ready this year. And I invite all of you to visit. So um, with that, I'll uh, stop. And I think then we can move on to the um, fireside chat. Thank you so much, Mukun. Yeah, I'm just adding all the speakers. Um, we do have a few questions to start you off. So if you would like to start with that, it would be great. 
Yeah, so um, uh, I, I was asked to sort of moderate this fireside chat and I'm, ha I'm happy to do that, but I'm going to start off with some questions I have. I'm going to use that prerogative. Um, first to Monica. Monica, how did you, uh, how did you end up, uh, what was the trajectory that led you uh, to this, uh, this fantastic uh, job you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm an art historian, and um, twenty years ago, I um, yeah, I was wondering what to do with my career and um, the knowledge that I acquired in the university. But then I saw that the internet communities and the, well, internet was exploding, and the, there was all these movements and yeah. Plat not platforms, communities at the time we called them communities that they were discussing really interesting stuff like um, yeah all the the roots of bio art were there the yeah every everything about a life complexity so yeah I got into that by listening to these guys and um, and it was really, yeah, vibrant and dynamic. And uh, then after the 2000s, I started to uh, curate small exhibitions in Barcelona, Madrid, maybe mainly. And I got a, an award as for a curator for a curatorial project where Oron Katz, Marta de Meneses, and all the pioneers of bio art were there. And so I got really motivated. Fast forward into the future, I the the job for the um, uh, curator, well, the the, um, the head of art satsang in to, was announced in 2014, and I applied for it. So there is no mystery. It was an application, yeah, applying for a job that was open. <laughs> and at, at the time, I think I was um, only, yeah, probably one of a few curators dealing with art and science that was not fully in the science museum's world, but uh, and not fully in the art museum's world. So I was in between and I think my profile was, yeah, a bit different. So yeah, I'm here eight years after. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, I think many people don't realize these trajectories are possible. And if they only knew they would, uh... Uh, everybody would be jumping between disciplines, and um, yeah. But you need to apply for the jobs. Huh? Of course, yeah. <laughs> they don't so, come as magic. <laughs> it's, it's much, and it's much more competitive now. There's, uh, yeah. you know, there's only one yeah. zone. Um, uh, Mike, I, I really love seeing um, those videos, what you showed, and uh, of course, you don't get the full experience. I can imagine just being there, and um, but it looks like you, you really. Uh, uh, work closely with artists in on these very long-term projects, starting from design uh, uh, all the way to then the public-facing event, um, and, and sort of it's a full circle. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a big project. How do you? Um, what What's the brief to the artists, and how do you judge if if such a thing is successful? Uh, that's a good point. I mean, usually, I mean, I, I suppose I see myself as an artist, actually, coming from a kind of fine art background thing and um but the, the work the collaborations usually come about because of some kind of need you know I, th I think that's you were saying about the, the opening yourself up and um and engaging with artists it's actually it's not easy working with somebody from a different discipline at all and this is rooted in the kind of education system you know there's there's uh I, I, it's interesting my having done fine art at, at art college uh, quite a while ago now um i always had this idea that uh, you know my career pathway followed that traditional artist route where you you leave art college with a ba and and you're an artist you know you, you, that doesn't happen in the sciences you know, it, it takes postdocs and mas and phds before you can become whatever that scientist is but my career pathway was to um get a studio get tuberculosis to die and then become famous and um, that that's sort of engraved in a lot of arts practice, I think. Whereas scientists have, you know, it, it is incredible working with uh, scientists who are driven by not just their personal interests and their motivations, but also by a career structure which is quite um, brutal, I think. And so, why on earth would anybody in the sciences want to work with with an artist who who doesn't meet them with some kind of 
shared need. And, and what you were saying there about that sort of language, the, the exchange of, of, of ideas is, um, is critical. You know, it, it's, that it's a collaboration. That's the key thing. And any interdisciplinary relationship is, is based on um, not necessarily a smooth thing. And I think the, you know, the, the grit in that relationship actually creates a friction, which it can be very useful. But I think there needs to be that starting point, some shared interest and recognition of a need to be solved in, and that's not a, you know, that, that's not in coming up with a, with a resolution of something, but actually the need to go on a journey of exploration, I think is, is critical. So um, actually there's a question that just showed up in the chat, which echoes something I was going to ask you. So, um, you know, in science, because as you said, the trajectory is so stereotypical, uh, students engaged in science already know what they're prepared for and they start on day one and they keep going. Whereas, at least in my experience working with artists, every individual engagement has been, it's like starting with somebody from scratch. They're exploring, they've discovered very individually and it's brought them to this unique place. Um, and uh, uh, and then you have to build up that comfort again. And so the, the question in the chat box is how, how do you make sure the artist doesn't, so there's an asymmetry here, okay? So, mm -hmm. so how do you make sure the artists don't feel isolated um, and and that this uh, uh, that they're accepted uh, into the whole process. It, it's it is difficult because I think it depends very much on what what your as as an artist what your discipline is. I mean, it's a sub discipline. You know, we we often in the arts people talk about interdisciplinary collaborations, and they're talking about a, a sculptor working with a with a painter yeah. operating in a digital world which which I do as as an artist or as a designer as an artist again blurring those kind of boundaries I think I, I feel I might be wrong but I feel like I have skills and insights that have come about through working with digital stuff data AI networking that is actually quite useful for the for the sciences you know just to, to give a different kind of visual perspective or a different visual language on things and I know the people that I work with um, in in communities like you know the Leonardo community or or Isaiah, there is there's something that they bring to the table, and um, th that's not to say that you can't do that from painting, but I think it's it's a little difficult because I, I really believe that the sciences have moved into a territory which is beyond just visual stuff. You know, it, it's data is not. And I know it doesn't suffer, like Nick Cave says, but it's it it is something that um, gives you an understanding of the world, which is radically different than a lot of our philosophical history. And so, being able to release yourself from just the representation is is critical. And is it then fair to say uh, it's about finding that common language based on the shared experiences as a precursor to the the actual collaboration? Uh, yeah, there's a sort of, I always thought, I just talk about sort of digital stuff as a kind of Rosetta Stone that allows you to translate across those kind of boundaries. It, that for, for me, and I know a lot of the people I work with, there is a common thing that we can talk about there, uh, which is a sort of mediation between the two disciplines. Um, and element of pragmatics there as well. So I, a similar question maybe to, to Monica. I know that uh, there are questions now. We're going to round off the fireside chat and move on to the, the, the Q&A part. But um, this is actually from a question that came earlier, uh, Monica. So, um, so the question I actually got reads, uh, how can we avoid the pitfalls of reductively appropriating scientific ideas and artworks slash by artists? So I just wanted to unpack that question and the worry that the, the person who asked uh, may have had. As a curator, is that question something you feel is... Uh, um, uh, a worry is it uh, simply something in the back of uh, people's minds? But you you uh, you engage and then and then see what the what the product is. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, the theme that's brought up by that question. I think um, I think it's a very good question and uh, very relevant because there is no uniformity in what art and science is. And uh, so um, let's I I like to think about perspective. So. Um, when you when you come to a laboratory as an artist, a laboratory of ten thousand people with a heavy 
and uh, yeah, complex technology that uh, does not allow you to have a hands-on experience like maybe in a bio lab you, you can have now, thanks to the work of many artists uh, in, the, in the 90s and 2000s. But uh, it, at CERN, you don't have this experience. You cannot deal with, I mean, superconducting materials, accelerators, etc. So, So you need to <clears throat> engage conceptually. But as an artist, you need to recognize <coughs> that you are working on a fridge. <laughs> yep, yep, we'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Yep. I, yeah, we, we know you, you said you were a little under the weather. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to, uh, to take a stab at this from the science point of view. I, I think one of the things that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, cultural issues that happen is precisely this, that in science, there are ways, um, there are these sort of external, it's unfortunate, but there are these external metrics by which we're judged. And there are these fairly standard processes by which you have uh, career advancement and so on. Um, and um, in the absence of that, uh, I found it very, uh, not disturbing, but I sort of lacked a coordinate system to see how to engage with an artist and uh, who, uh, which ones to engage with when they first came up uh, to the institution and said, we'd like to have a residency here. Uh, and this is our idea. Um, and uh, at first pass, all those ideas sound equally fun, uh, but uh, it's hard to, without training in the field as, as a fine artist or as an art curator and so on with that experience, it's hard to judge which one of these are deep engagements. Uh, which ones are superficial, which ones are um, uh, risky, but potentially uh, exciting. Um, and um, the, the way, of course, we get around this is we have a, a slate of advisors who come from many disciplines who uh, who help us um, make these choices. And then we trust them because of our years of experience with them and we rely on them. Um, so it's these people, you know, it's so important who the people are. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, I think Bangalore is a fantastic place because we have uh, all these practitioners here working with each other for years and they've built that that trust between them so each one can reach out to the networks of the other people um and and it's in that for that reason that that we're able to keep this uh, this engagement uh, uh going I, I don't know if that uh, sounds uh, like a familiar thing to to both of you definitely the community uh, you know goes beyond and i think that's what we're talking about really is enriching that community by uh, sharing and uh, enabling the kind of collaborative processes that, and, and that community stepping outside of it, the comfort zone of its own discipline. And, but I, I think there's also a, a kind of risk in assuming that that these disciplinary kind of walls are, are, do not have their own kind of disagreements within them. I, I work with earth scientists and we have instrumentalists, you know, people who go and measure stuff with technology. They call the data that's collected by um, the sort of humanists who, again, uh, earth scientists who go out and talk to people, look at data data that's collected from people's sheds where they talk about when the first cuckoo was heard and things like that, you know, this kind of people who sense the world. They call that data, the instrumentalists call that data dirty data, you know, and there's a real tension between them about how valid that th their insights are. But also, uh, you know, I, I work with theoretical physicists and um, you know the, the difference between uh, practical, you know, practical the physicists and um, theoretical physicists is is extraordinary. They they really there's a lot of tension there. You know, re redefines the Big Bang. Actually, you get two of those physicists together. It's uh, there's a lot of disagreement. No, it's a very interesting answer. I mean, people don't realize from the outside how much cultural difference there is between what appear to be minor disciplinary variations within these uh, boundaries. Okay, I, I think we should um, um, move on to the question. There's a bunch of questions in the chat box. Um, so, um, Kartika, should I? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, on the same document, it's been sort of uh, categorized. So I've updated it for you. So maybe you could. Um... Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with it in the chat. So um, I think uh, one question, um, uh, uh, Monica, if you're, uh, if you're okay with it, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you because it echoes something. <clears throat> mentioned at the end of your presentation. As an artist, uh, Kavita asks, pattern maker, I can view the beauty and patterns in science in a very aesthetic sense that is very fulfilling. Do scientists change the way they view their work after collaborating with an artist? Does it then acquire an aesthetic 
dimension. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> that's, that's, I don't have an answer for that. I, I think some art, some artists might change their aesthetic uh, <clears throat> appreciation as well when they uh, listen to um, and discuss with a theoretical physicist about the idea of beauty, uh, beauty in uh, in uh, equation. <clears throat> Why is this equation beautiful from your point of view? What is, yeah, why is beautiful? It, 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 and, but it, it's this fundamental idea uh, from my perspective as a theoretical physicist, this brings so much beauty in, into this, yeah, thing. So that's a very subjective approach, but also Usually, what what they see is that theoretical physicists agree about this idea of beauty, and and this is very interesting. So um, <clears throat> I'm not personally very interested in the aesthetic approach. What how artists can yeah beautify <laughs> science and uh, transfer that or translate that into the experience of a scientist. <clears throat> But the dealing, the negotiation of what beauty or yeah, aesthetic pleasant is for each of them, individually as a, and as a community. <clears throat> there is definitely there a discussion that is worth it to tackle all, every time you go to a laboratory because uh, it's, yeah, beautiful is very preconceived. And I don't go into the philosophical approach of what beautiful is means or beauty but um yeah from an experiential level you realize that you <clears throat> you are working under yeah very fixed frameworks of yeah aesthetic frameworks as an artist and as, as a scientist yeah I, actually i i agree um, <clears throat> i i would sort of dispute the premise of that question i think scientists engage with their their work uh, uh, also using an aesthetic uh, uh point of view along with other things that they've been taught um, because you have to choose your questions you, you you only once you choose and articulate a question do you get to do more science about it and and often the difference between good and bad science between interesting impactful and and, and more derivative science is that that choice of question which which has you know in in some sense a, a broader uh, science doesn't tell you internally what questions to ask uh, it tells you how to answer them um, so 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 you can't divorce it from somebody's taste uh, and if you ask a mathematician, they'll tell you they dream about these things, right? So uh, <laughs> um, th there's a there's a question um, from uh, Amitabh. Um, uh, I'll I'll punt to uh, Mike. Um, how how can the intersection of art and science force climate change into the public imagination in a way that the alarming data or explorative fiction haven't been able to to get over what Amitabh Ghosh called the Great Derangement? This is another one of tough, yeah. tough questions today. <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? Because I think there's, um, I, I think one of the problems, again, you know, looking at domes and stuff like that, I think one of the problems people have uh, generally just with understanding the world is, is a sense of, of scale and dimension and the, the sort of scalar, the transscalar, you know, between the smallest thing imaginable to the, to the largest thing possible, you know, this, this sort of infinity and, it's um you know we live on this kind of meso scale which is uh also really problematic because it we can't quite quantify the the amount of damage something does or the amount of single use plastics we put into the sea and and uh, e even our recognizing our own footprint in this larger human footprint and i i think um if anything it, that that, that um, you know it could do in terms of art creating an experience with somebody is to actually contextualize and highlight um, and uh, experientialize what our impact is individually you know and then we might have a greater sense of what our collective impact is and then maybe we might be able to take some kind of responsibility for it and I think there are so many divisions in in the world in the way that we 
you know, we delegate responsibilities to organizations, institutions, and things like that. And so we lose touch with our own um, kind of identity as, as, as an actor in, in this space, really, I think. And um, when you have a personal and emotive experience, it does sort of, in many occasions, uh, jerk you into a kind of position of realization. And I, I think that's, and, and this is a big problem with the kind of content that you see in uh, that's produced for a lot of dome context. You, know, you get these big productions that come out of Denver, which are um, edutainment. You know, and, and actually, they they you you can see the beauty in something. You can echo, "Wow, you know, it's awesome. This is incredible. I've, I've just flown to the edge of the universe and think, known universe and things like that." And um, and yet, you walk away with with no real narrative to carry beyond that uh, into your personal life. Um, so there's a. It's not just about spectacle. It is something about a meaningful experience, and it it isn't easy. <laughs> I think that's a uh, a perfect point to uh, close because we're at six uh, forty two. But um, uh, there are other questions which are uh, specifically about how one applies to these programs, how one gets funded, and um, so on. I think uh, if I could ask the organizers to collect this information from the participants and maybe share it as a document with all the uh, all the people online that might be useful because it looks like uh, we've done our job and got people interested. So um, that's all you can do in 30 minutes. Um, and, and and the rest is just uh, is picking up the thread. But I, I really love what uh, Mike said at the end, which is the whole point of this is to, it's a meaningful engagement, put something into somebody's head, which then later, uh, becomes relevant to them and, and they, they realize that something they've seen in the past changes the way they're seeing something in, in front of them. I mean, if you've done that for one person, I think that's it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing to see that happening uh, to someone. And uh, so uh, I think uh, I'll hand back to Kamya. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you so much, all of you, uh, Monica, Mukund, Mike. I think we did, you did do the job of at least getting people to ask a lot of questions and engage. So thank you so much for that. And thanks to folks in the audience. Um, there are many questions here that need answers. And half an hour from the speakers, or even one hour, even more than one hour from the speakers, won't do that justice. But please uh, keep asking your questions. And I do invite you to come to Bangalore between the 10th and the 26th of March this year. Um, come and see us at the festival. We're in a couple of different places in Bangalore, and we will be online as well. So please sign up on our recently launched website. Uh, really, really fresh off the press. So please get in there and drop us your email so we can keep you in the loop of all the online uh, activities as well as the Bangalore-based activities for those of you who can make it. Thank you so much, and Irini, uh, if you'd like to say a few words before. Yes, a big thank you from me as well, uh, Mukund, Monica, and Mike. It's been great to hear your contributions and also your insights in that. And uh, I just wanted to say that they, you, you reminded us that these uh, collaborations between artists and scientists require the care and dedication of people like you, but also organizations. And of course, they, there are so many things that need to be put in place. And I hope that you continue the amazing work and you inspire more uh, and more organizations in the future, uh, because of course, we need these exchanges more than ever, especially as things uh, with all the, um, the the challenges that we're facing. So so thank you again for, for today. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the festival. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, soon, Monica. <laughs> <laughs>